Welcome to the 42 Podcast, where a Christian and an atheist sit down to discuss the meanings of life, the universe, and everything else in between. Thank you for joining us. Well, how you doing, Lindsay? I'm really good today. I am good. It's a good day. Good, because, because I'm about to dad joke you. Oh boy. Yeah, I haven't seen you since last year. <laughs> mm. Well, I haven't seen you for, I guess it's been about two weeks since we recorded. Your beard is getting pretty wild. I know. I like it. I, I'm i in a uh, gnomish. silent duel. No, not gnomish, <laughs> but I, I'm calling it a silent duel with my wife. Is she growing her beard out too? No, but I'm just seeing how long it can get before she's like, you're going to trim it or you're going to wake up without a beard. <laughs> so we'll we'll see what happens. <laughs> I'm aiming for like ZZ top length here, you know, mm. but this is, this is getting rather majestic. <laughs> it's very Tolkien somehow. Uh, hey, I, well, go with it. Calvinistic, but sure. <laughs> <laughs> so how was Christmas? It was nice. It was laid back besides the yeah. chaos of the initial kids opening their presents. It was a really quiet day. Oh, good. Kids love the switch. Good. I love the Switch. It was fun. <laughs> hey, do you guys have Zelda Breath of the Wild? I love it. Okay. Good, I like cause... lose time while I'm playing it. That's an incredible game. That's one that I've played several different times. Although there's a part of me that's like, I don't want to restart because I, I love where I'm at in the game. Eh, but yes, that is an amazing game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's very relaxing. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, I'm in the beginning, yeah. and I'm I just love the pace of it, and it's good. It it gets better throughout. It really does. <clears throat> anyway, aside from that, so it was a good Christmas. Everyone had a, a good time for you guys. Yeah. What about you? Yeah, it was it was really good, and I I kind of have a perfect segue into our topic with a Christmas gift I was given. Mm-hmm. But it was a good Christmas. Everyone enjoyed it. My kids got bikes. We're teaching them to ride. We're having fun with, uh, you know, they got a Switch game, and I I don't remember what else. But they they had a good Christmas. So good. and my wife got me new Scotch glasses and whiskey bullets. So yeah, it was good. Next time, let me see. Yeah. Well, yeah. I. <laughs> yeah, you're sitting there enjoying a uh, a whiskey, mm-hmm. and I'm sitting here on my. 12th cup of coffee today so that's not fair (laughs) but anyway so i i did kind of say i got a christmas gift that segues perfectly into our conversation today Mm. all right and i kind of have to ask a question first Lindsay, is there an nfl team that you root for only provincially i support the patriots because they're from where i live i no i no but i honestly i couldn't care less except for we live in the Mm-mm. same region. That's nope. It. Nope. I'm nope. not an Eagles That's a big fan. Nope. Not an Eagles fan because I don't live there uh, anymore. I was an Eagles wait, fan you while think I lived I'm an there. Eagles fan? I don't know. You live in. Do you think I'm an Eagles fan? Oh, I don't know. Oh. Just assumed. Yeah, uh huh. Uh huh. I am not an Eagles fan. <laughs> I'm a Stollers guy. I grew up in Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh is. That's you know, right. That, I forgot that about was, that. The first 18 years of my life, Dealers, Pens, and Pirates. Those are my teams. Hmm. And all other teams are the teams that they have to play to get to the playoffs. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> you know, it, by that counting, there have only been truly six Super, Bowl, su- bleh, six Super Bowls and however many other practice Super Bowls until the Steelers get there. <laughs> that's That's by my counting. But... The, the segue in this is, as a Steelers guy, I have little, like, superstitions mm-hmm. about what I do every NFL season mm-hmm. with, you know, my game day practices, how I watch the game, how I interact with, with the, the team, all of that. 
And one of the weird ones I have is I will not buy any kind of Steelers merchandise. Because the year I bought, I don't even remember what, what it was. It was like a hat. It was one of the worst years for the Steelers. So I don't buy Steelers stuff. Huh. You don't. But I don't. Mm. And I, I don't normally wear it. But my Eagles fan cheering daughter bought me Steelers socks. Aww. Which I am deeply conflicted about because I love my sweet, precious little girl. But you didn't buy them. I know, but it's Steelers merchandise, and it, it plays into You're that superstition where it's... going to have to experiment. This might be worth experimenting I... on. It's already been bought. But... You're already doomed. And, and I get that. Now, I will say this. She bought those socks, and the Steelers went from having a incredible winning streak run to losing three games in a row that I, I just don't want to talk about with mm. how bad it was. To when she bought me those socks, then it was the next game, and by some hat trick, the Steelers won. Could have been the socks. It could have been the socks. I, but th that's one of those just little goofy, weird superstitions that I am incredibly aware of this time of year with, you know, how I watch the games, what I do in the games, what I wear. But I think, I think it really does big kind of a question of what kind of superstitions do you have mm -hmm. do you have any ones that you've like encountered where you're like wow that's really weird and interesting you know what e even what is the value of a superstition well that i can discuss <laughs> <laughs> here's my you have opinions is on it that. too early to just give you my theory on this no i think up front we can give a theory and Okay. You know, talk about it. Here's my theory. I think that superstition scratches the same itch that religion does. You've got something that you don't understand. How the Steelers win, besides talent. It's chance, right? You've got something you don't understand. Anything that you can come across that might influence those chances, such as you bought something... And your team lost, so you're never going to buy that again. I see that as an evolutionary advantage. Because you might be right <laughs> if some caveman, you know, wore his pelt inside out one time and didn't get the saber tooth or whatever he was hunting. He's never going to do that again because what if it was related? Or what if it was something like, I don't know, something that actually influenced the hunt or something. So I see it as evolutionary because even people describe superstitions as they have a ritual of doing a certain thing before every game. They call it a ritual, which is very mm -hmm. religion-y or lit like a liturgy of sports or games or what have you. So that's that's my that's my theory. That would actually be a great book title, like The Liturgy of Sports, Superstitions by Team. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I I'm not a sports writer, but hey, if you're a sports writer out there and you're listening to us, take it. There we Run give you an it. idea. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. I, I don't think you're entirely wrong with that theory, but what I find fascinating is the direct tie-in to religion that you make, whereas I look at it and I, I connect it with behavioral tendencies over religion. And I guess the reason I do that is because the... The implication of having a superstition is that there's a transactional nature. I don't have any kind of Steelers gear, therefore the Steelers will win. Right. And and to me, it's it's not a rational or reasonable transaction. It just it isn't. You know, ben, Big Ben doesn't call me up on Sunday or Mondays when they play and go, "Hey, you didn't buy anything from the Steelers store this week, right? Right? We're still good. We're still good. You know." But it makes you feel better. Irrationally, yes. Absolutely. So just a question. Do you feel better having gone to church and done the church things? And, you know, basically you're living right before God. You feel good that you're that in a way God is going to protect you and keep you safe because it's sort of even though you you say it's not transactional, but I think it's transactional. There's this ag I, this uh, agreement, a covenant, that you obey God and do these things. And he, at the very most... 
this is where I'll differ with you. Okay. Because where you're looking at things is under Old Covenant, Old Testament Covenant. And we're, we're going to, I guess, jump into uh, some Jesus moments with this. But under Old Covenant, it was a transactional relationship. You do X, God does Y. That was how it was meant to work. Because Adam and Eve did X, and God said don't do X, so the reaction was Y, which is death. But mm-hmm. then there are the covenants that God enters into, and going all the way back to the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis, uh, I think it's 11 or 12 off the top of my head. You got me looking this up now, because I actually just read it this morning, too. Ah, sorry, Genesis 15. So you have that Abrahamic covenant, which is tied to a promise, which is even connecting that God in making that covenant with Abraham is saying that you can't even uphold all of this promise. I have to uphold both ends, which in the Christian tradition is what points to Christ, one of the first early pointings. Under Christ, the nature of the relationship with God changes because it's no longer covenant-based, like it was in the Old Testament, it's a new covenant, which is saying you can't. There's so nothing you can do. It technically still got paid. You just didn't do, do the paying. Right. All we can do is accept that it's been paid. And this is where it gets different because nothing I do in my spiritual acts of worship has anything to do with what God or does or doesn't bless me with. Again, that's kind of pulling back into that covenant transactional relationship. And, you know, Jesus isn't going to... It's a razor's edge, so I'm trying to think how to phrase Mm. this. Because your prayers are heard and valued, and they do have an effect. But your piety... Piety? Piety? Mm -hmm. Your righteousness, your holiness, it, it doesn't change that prayer relationship it doesn't change you know you're not given and imbued with power that oh you've done x y and z so you're okay you get a pass on this it's there's a will of god that plays into it and the transition from covenant to christ takes it into a more personal level that is it's relationally dangerous is the word i want to use because you're not in a relationship where it's I've done X, Y, Z, so God will do A, B, C. It's, I don't know entirely what God is doing, but he's opening it up and trying to bring me alongside freely instead of I have to do. Which, that's that's different than what some fundamental churches will teach. That's different than what, uh, well, yeah, fundamentalists are, are primarily in that camp of X, Y, Z gets you A, B, C. So you don't believe God protects you extra special because you're a Christian? Nope. That sucks. <laughs> Even in the, the Gospels in the New Testament, Jesus says, look, if you're going to follow me, there's a cost. And the cost isn't going to be easy or light. There's grace and there's hope. But just in calling on Christ does not guarantee safety. It doesn't guarantee an easier walk. And that's that's where I've come to wrestle with it. And, wow, we, we superstition took us into... Well, uh, well, no, maybe not. Do you believe the inverse, then, that somebody who is a Christian and who is deliberately sinning and maybe falling away and doing maybe almost demonic things, so, you know, going outside of that covenant, op- opening themselves up, right? Isn't that the language to demonic attack, right? Isn't that kind of um, superstitious? That That's going into another razor edge conversation because how that aspect of faith works out, there is an adversary, there is an oppressor, but that adversary and oppressor, it's easy and cheap to paint that adversary and oppressor as making big, grand moves that we can see, we can fight, we can... What if he just makes your kids sick? Well, not just what if he makes your kids sick. I mean, even one of the simplest delusions is there is no adversary. Is it easier to lull someone into a state of complacency than to be big and reveal your hand? 
Which would you prefer, a complacent person who just never questions, or someone who is maybe a little overzealous? And it, so it's it's that that balance. But do you think that as a Christian, if bad things happen to you, it could possibly be attributed to something evil if you're not obeying the way you should or staying in covenant? Um, not directly, no. There are people who are entirely out of covenant and out of Christianity and nothing evil ever graces their life. You know, from from a worldly perspective, it appears that they're blessed. But then there are those who are Christian and better at being in covenant than I could ever. And they have hard walks of faith that that test them and give them a trial. And I can't look and say that that either way is correct. There's an unknown aspect of God's will. For each of us, we just, how we determine it is by walking with him. Hmm. So do and you... And that's... So go go ahead. ahead. No, no, you. Finish your thought. Um, That's not an easy statement, because in saying that, it's breeding complexity into the answer. Because the complexity is entirely dependent on the individual and on how God is working and moving in their life where something big or something small may be that act of the, the the grand act of work that they're meant to do in God's will and design. But how, how you determine that is it's complex. Yeah. There's no simple, easy answer because of the relational nature that is there. It is complex, isn't it? (laughs) It's cheaper and easier to sell that. Oh, there's an adversary, and if you go out of the, out of these bounds of scripture, then you know the devil's going to get you. So, what do you think Paul meant then when he said to deliver that man from Corinthians to Satan, the man who was sleeping with his mother or something yucky? Just simply put, that sometimes leaving someone in the depth of their sin will will reveal to them kind of how low they've sunk. So it has nothing actually to do with Satan? Well, I mean, Satan is the, the grand liar, the, the master of sin. So saying, leave him to the hands of Satan, leave him to the hands of his sin, is to say, we're, we're going to be hands off until he either sees how low he is, or he just entirely, yeah, <laughs> entirely goes mad. Hmm. Interesting. So. I have nothing. Not what you expected? Oh... <laughs> Nothing, f- no. <laughs> I'll have to, I, you want I, a simple answer that you can fight. Ah. No, no. It, I I was brought up think, believing that submission to God is like an umbrella. And especially as a woman, I heard this all the time, that my, the head, my head was my father. And just like Sarah and Abraham, Abraham told Sarah to lie and say that um, she was his sister and she obeyed because that's what she was supposed to do and in Peter it even commends her for just obeying him and calling him Lord so in the same way I'm called to obey my father and now my husband and if I step out from under that umbrella I'm open to all the slings and arrows of the enemy I, I that's how I grew up <laughs> believing that you could be open to demon possession and all kinds of corruption and deception when you go out from under that protection. Even if you move out on your own and want to live by yourself, you could get, you could, um, you're, you're out from under the protection of an authority, and that's bad news. So I guess, and to bring that around to superstition, that's why you just obey. That's why you obey and go to church and do the things so that you don't end up demon-possessed in Calcutta somewhere. <laughs> That uh, <laughs> have you been demon possessed in Calcutta recently? Not recently. <laughs> oh, okay. Just checking, making sure that you're still in your closet at home, not <laughs> hiding somewhere in Calcutta. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's and that's the fundamentalist transactional relationship and understanding. That's not the root of that. That you said is Paul's. You know. Uh, Oh my goodness, I can't remember where it is in scripture. I hate when I we do that. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. 
Uh, no, Paul, and the, you know, husband to one wife and be submissive to your hud- Peter. Uh, husband. Peter. I think and, it was first or second yeah. Peter. I can't remember which one. Was it Peter? Yeah, Peter oh, in particular that says, w- it's, that's the part where um he talks about women, it's good for women to just, something about braided hair and their adornment should be on the inside and la 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 type thing. And some of that actually comes from the culture that they were dealing with and ministering in the time because there are some beautiful complexities of the culture where like when Paul is, and I may butcher some of my references here, but like when Paul is dealing directly with don't let women teach, a lot of that actually has to do with the fact that where he was writing that letter to, women teaching was a part of temple worship, but it was temple prostitution. So when you say... I was sitting under a teacher. You really mean something else? Howdy doody. <laughs> <laughs> um, where, where that's a part of it, where it's okay. So we're, we're trying to, because there had been a conversion from in that city and some of the women who had been a part of that temple had come into the church. And now it's going, y- y- no, temple prostitution is not something we do as Christians. So that's part of the cultural context. Yeah, I'll have to pull those references yeah. and send them to you. I have that. I, I wrote that down in a notebook. I think that's still at the office. But it, it's unique. And so when we look at some of those letters, we also have to understand where, who, and how they're writing, why they're writing. And within the context of just that route, again, going back to where I was trying to, you being subject to your husband and subject to your father and the whole family structure, that's important and that's of value. But that's also going back into the root of Adam and Eve, because God made, and and this is where I look at it, and I, I see that root and go, okay, it's not just submission, it's how the unit of the family is supposed to work. And uh, my wife is subject to me, but she and I work together. I don't just run around demanding that she does everything I think, it's... Yeah. She and I are a team, and that being a team together is going back to what the original purpose of creation of God made Adam, and then out of Adam took 50% of who he was, and so Adam and Eve together are stronger than Adam and Eve apart, and the, the ideals that are being written in the New Testament is husband and wife together are stronger than husband and wife apart. Yeah. But there's still that ugly word subject. You're kind of like you're kind of like a good master, but you're still a master. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you, Lindsay, you know my wife. Yeah. <laughs> you you've met her. She is uh, she is a force of nature in her own, and a fiery redhead. Ah, uh, but that sounds patronizing almost. So I I, I know who you, I. It's it's just. Oh, sh- she is a beautiful, wonderful, fierce woman who I respect, and she's not going to put up with my bull crap. And she and I work together. Yeah. You know? And <laughs> the yeah the the expression of that balance in scripture sounds like it's me over her, but it's us together. I mean, there are elements where she defers to me, but then there are other elements where I defer to her. And that's part of that's just our knowledge base, our expertise, our experiences. You know, she's a better wife and mother than I could be. You don't want to see me as well. <laughs> <laughs> she's back at work. The kids are back at school. I'm at home, working from home. So we've been joking that I'm now the housewife. As it should be. <laughs> <laughs> I cook, I clean, I do the dishes. I mean, come on. I watch soap <laughs> operas, apparently. <laughs> But it, it's her and I together. It's her and I working through life together. And that's a good inter... I, I guess I appreciate your relationship. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just laughing because it's... The entire intention of this episode was to talk about superstitions. I had... Oh, where'd my, I don't know. I had a whole list of fun, goofy superstitions and we just... Went entirely different. Well, we can always keep going and edit out what you want to edit out, and oh no, I think this has been a good conversation. 
<laughs> no, I think this has been a good conversation. I think we'll have to return to superstition. But yeah, and, and I'm sorry, I am running short on time because I got to get moving pretty quick. Okay. So, but no, it's it's been good. I mean, that's one of the things that I've been looking at with where we're at with this podcast is we need to go a little bit deeper. And part of our struggle on that is we have a half hour to touch on topics. But this is this is scratching just a little bit deeper into that surface, and that's kind of where I want us to start going with this and challenging each other a little and pushing back and still having fun. Why do you, you know, feel like we're stuck at half an hour? I don't feel like we're stuck at half an hour. We've That's our average right now. I think we can go longer for sure uh, or break it I, up into two sections or something. I don't disagree, and we're going to revisit this topic most definitely because – I didn't get to talk about whistling indoors. Did you know that was a superstition? No, I didn't. Yeah. Yeah, in Lithuania, it's a superstition. If you whistle indoors, you summon a demon. Hmm. <whistles> well, in China, they have architecture that is purely to for for superstitious reasons to keep the demons off your house. So Stupidly, I whistled. I used the same whistle for the dogs. So now the dogs uh, the the demon chihuahua is barking upstairs. <laughs> My Why little vicious ankle biter. We could do superstition part two next time. We could do it next time, but I might have also promised in that single episode that everyone will probably listen to, that was mm-hmm. just me talking for ten minutes, that we would talk about pop culture and introduce the book club. Oh, cool. Yes. That's right. So I think we're going to have to put a pin in the superstition stuff and uh, return to it. We will. And, you know, next week we we talk about pop culture elements that we've each enjoyed. Uh Uh-oh, you're thinking. I'm trying to I'm trying to think of the book that we're going to that I'm going to recommend. And that's all. Well, we're only doing one recommendation. Oh, per month. And then we'll do a different one next month or something. Yeah, we'll, we'll figure out what the balance of it is, if it's a month or two months or how, however. But we're only going to do one book recommendation, then we'll take time to read it and come back and talk about it. Cool. Sounds good. So, yeah. Do you have ideas? So, you don't get... Uh, yes. I <laughs> he do. said twirling I'm... his beard. <laughs> yes, my beard, again, rather majestic. <laughs> Going for that ZZ top look eventually. I want it to be nice in here. <laughs> um, yeah, I have a few recommendations I'm I'm thinking of. Hey, you said you have Amazon Prime, right? Yes. Have you watched the show The Expanse? I know of it, but I haven't seen it. You recommend? Okay. I, I do recommend. It is a really good show, and they try to be scientifically accurate with physics and how rockets work in space. So it's not just, oh, look, we need to go over here. (laughs) Fun. Yeah. Um, Because when they go, oh, look, we need to go over here, someone splatters against the bulkhead and turns into a bloody mess. Mm. I I recommend the show, but there's also a book series Mm. uh, that I want to read. So that might be a recommendation down the road from me. We'll see. Cool. All right, Lindsay. This one has been uh, not what I planned, but I, I think it was pretty good. I think so, too. It was fun. It was a very good conversation. Good. Good. (laughs) So, hey, and by the way, it truly is New Year's. Happy New Year. Happy New Year's. So, all right. I got to get going. All right. Well, you take care. You too. Bye. Well, you've gotten to the end of the podcast. And normally at the end of the podcast, this is where I ask Lindsay, are we still friends? But unfortunately, due to uh, extenuating circumstances, her audio isn't here for that part of our conversation. And I'm going to blame it on the fact that she's a Patriots fan, which really pushed the envelope of me being able to say I'm still friends with Lindsay. But here we are. 
we're going to keep doing a podcast. And I'm going to try and get past the whole... Pa- mm, it, it, it hurts to say it, but... Patriots fan of a friend that Lindsay is. Whatever football team you root for, I hope we can all still be friends, even if you are a Patriots, Browns, or Ravens fan. I guess the Eagles count in that too. But hey, I'm a Steelers guy. So, harass me as well. Thank you for listening. If this podcast has earned it, like, share, review, and hey, join in the conversation. Thanks. We'll see you next week.